Well, good morning, everybody. Can uh, is the audio coming through all right? Well, good morning, everybody. Is the audio coming through all right? Uh, okay, I see it in the chat. Very good. Uh, we'll give it another 30 seconds here for folks to get on and then we'll get started. Okay, well, we'll get this started. Uh, again, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to NARCON and for my presentation specifically. Um, what this says, we're, we're gonna talk about uh, photographing, mostly still photography rockets. Uh, I'm Jim Wilkerson, I have my company, Tahoma Photography and NAR 29221 and level three. There we go. For today's session, again, thanks for attending. We'll run about 45 minutes. We'll have a 10 minute, 15 minute Q&A. Um, I'm going to occasionally check the chat function, but it's mostly for you guys to talk to each other. Um, Q&A functions used for questions the last 10 minutes or so. And I'll read and answer them in the order perceived or received, excuse me. Um, we're not going to interrupt for questions. I'm just going to get through it and I can go back to particular slides if you want. You can submit a question at any time uh, during the presentation and the VNARCON sessions are all recorded for later viewing. So with that, we'll get started. Uh, just a little bit briefly about me. I joined the NAR in February of 1978, the NARHAMS section in Maryland. Got my first camera, uh, a Kodak 110 Instamatic about the same time. I was the on, a member of the NAR championship section at NARAM 22 with the Wheaton Association of Rocketry. I was also a member of the 1983 and 1985 uh, NAR Internet's teams, the first one to Novi Sanch, Poland, the second one to Yambol, Bulgaria. Uh, parachute and stream regression in 83 and RCRG in, <clears throat> excuse me, 85. So on yearbook staff in uh, high school and college, uh, graduated uh, to a Konica FT1 and Canon A1 and AE1 uh, 35 millimeter film cameras. Also used some uh, Mamiya and Bronica uh, medium format cameras in college. I spent 20 years in the Air Force, active in reserve, uh, flying KC-135s, C-141s, and C-17s. I didn't do as much rocketry during my time in the Air Force until I got into the reserves in 2001, but I did continue to take pictures. Uh, I spent six years in the Air Force Reserve, C-17s, uh, as a, and also working at Boeing uh, until the present day as a commercial airplanes instructor pilot in most of the 7 Series aircraft. The picture you see is me and my son, Nicholas, at Balls uh, using some of the equipment I, I have. Capture rocket launch. Uh, my first digital camera is a Sony point and shoot in 2001. Started in high power in 2001. I got my level one and level two and level three in the early 2000s. Uh, transitioned to digital for the first time in 2014. Uh, joined the NAR board in 2018. And that same year picked up my same uh, mirrorless camera, Nikon Z6. And started working on last year on a remote uh, camera trigger to capture far away high power launches was my most active year last year. I spent, I went to NSL, NARAM 62, NXRS for Oregon Rocketry folks, LDRS 39, Balls 29, uh, UR Nuts launch back in the playa with UREC, and an evolution space commercial shot down at the FAR site in California. I've done in-depth coverage of TARC and SLI in previous years, and I hope to see folks at MDRA at the uh, Red Glare and other events. Pictures with Ed Pearson, it's been an uh, important part of my life all the way through my rocketry career. Uh, this is us at TARC in 2019. <clears throat> so we're going to cover today, we're going to cover some photography basics, uh, some equipment differences, the subject characteristics for the photos, uh, some of the techniques and settings that I use, uh, some of the types of shots that I like to capture, 
uh, we'll touch a little on processing digital images, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the remote camera system that I've got in work. This is a picture of me in 1982 at Stonehenge. Uh, Herb Desmond uh, kindly let me a center rock to take over to the UK and have some video uh, stills, some more stills and video uh, center rock footage of uh, a launch at Stonehenge. And you can find that if you search Stonehenge on the NAR Facebook group. Uh, I'm gonna quickly check the chat, see if anyone's having any difficulties. Okay, that all looks good. Okay, uh, let's talk about some photography basics. Three main controls a photographer has, <clears throat> your aperture, f-stop, your shutter speed, or your and your sensor sensitivity. In film cameras, you used to control that by getting different types of film. Uh, so the aperture or f-stop is how wide the opening is in the lens. The wider the aperture that you have, the more light will hit the film or the sensor. And rocket launches occur mostly during the day. So fortunately, there's uh, typically lots of light although we do do the night launches from time to time. Shutter speed is how much time does the light have to hit the shutter? The faster the shutter speed, the less light gets on the camera. But for quick moving um, items like rockets, uh, you really do want a fast shutter speed to capture the stop action. The last thing is the sensor sensitivity. It's referred to as ISO. And I can't remember what those initials stand for, but uh, that's the way they used to rate film. If you remember, they had 100, 200, 400, 800, and the sensor uh, sensitivities. These days, these um, digital SLRs can go up to uh, 51,000 and above on the uh, on the ISO. Uh, let's see, a couple other notes here. Okay. So, uh, talk about some equipment. Uh, several main types of cameras. You have a, a point and shoot, which has an integral lens. You typically don't swap the lenses out on that one. They typically also will have an electronic zoom that extends a smaller mechanical lens. Uh, for example, the Nikon Coolpix 900 series, they claim um, electronic zoom out to 3,000 millimeters, which is pretty incredible. A friend of mine got some interesting moon shots with one of those. They can have a limited sh uh, shutter speed, excuse me, and ISO or sensor sensitivity. The uh, SLR single lens reflex and its uh, current companion, the digital SLR, you basically have a mirror that flips up when you hit the shutter button. And the mirror provides the optical path from the viewfinder of the camera out through the lens to the subject, the mirror moves up. When the shutter button's activated, <clears throat> excuse me, and then light travels through the lens to the film or digital sensor. And the latest revision to the digital cameras are the mirrorless. Um, there's no mirror between the subject and the lens, no direct optical path from the viewfinder to the subject. You, the viewfinder that you see is a digital representation. It allows for a faster shutter speed and wider apertures um, under F1, for those of you that are familiar with the F-stop ratings. Um, and the cell phones are also mirrorless. Uh, your cell phones are everywhere. They uh, Everyone has one. They're good for candid photos. Uh, the rockets often can move too quickly for a quality launch picture with the cell phone. Uh, you can also do frame grabs from videos. Uh, they may still be blurry. The native apps on most of your cell phones are okay for point and shoot type photography. You can get aftermarket apps that allow you more control over uh, aperture or shutter speed. And those really may be electronic representations of what happens in an SLR, but um, those are easily available on a search. Most of the phones will shoot either RAW or JPEG images. We'll talk about those images in a bit. The one thing, uh, I, my major drawback with the cell phone is that the lens, you're never going to have a lens bigger than the size of a pea, and that never is going to substitute for a, a good two or three inch piece of Nikon or Canon uh, glass element in the lens that you have. Uh, <clears throat> Just like most things uh, in photography, if you want better capabilities, it's going to cost you more money. The cell phone, uh, under 100 to over $1,000, and uh, we also mentioned the non-native uh, photo applications that are available. You have uh, your consumer DSLR packages. You can pick those up at Costco or Best Buy. It's a decent basic starter kit into an SLR. You possibly may be limited with your ISO and your shutter speed. And you'll have lens apertures in the uh, f5 or 6 point, the 6.3 range a bundle of a camera body and one to two lenses and accessories anywhere from 400 to 600 dollars typically 
what we call the prosumer, kind of halfway between the uh, this, the entry level consumer cameras and, uh, and your pro series uh, equipment. Now you get improved ISO and shutter speed and you get some smaller or some larger lens apertures, I should say, uh, still in the 3.5 to 5.6 range. And you'll get bundles anywhere from the eight to $1,500 range. And these are estimates. I mean, there's um, obviously sales and things change, but uh, the picture, I, let me go back to slide and talk about that first picture. Um, I was at Miami for some simulator training with my colleague, uh, Dave Whitaker, uh, during the week of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo launch. So, and I live in the, in the Seattle area. So I brought the, one of the Estes one to 200 Saturn fives down with me and my luggage. And, we went and found the Hobby Lobby and launched it on some C63s. We were driving around looking uh, looking for a field to launch the aircraft and or launch the rocket. And it turns out the first one we picked was on the approach to Miami's runway nine. So we decided that probably wasn't the greatest place in the world to launch rockets. And this is a recovery picture of the of the rocket. Um, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, pro-grade camera, you get your best auto ISO and shutter speed available. You get ISOs uh, 51,000 and above and shutter speeds of 18,000 and faster. Uh, the newly released flagship Nikon Z9 has a shutter speed of 1 32,000th of a second. It can take 120, 11 uh, megapixel JPEG images in a second, which is kind of mind boggling. Uh, you'll get lens apertures in the uh, 1.4 to 2.8 range. And just for comparison, typically what your eye will see is, a, is in the 50 millimeter range. So, the, uh, um, so that's kind of what, uh, disregard, that's not what I'm talking about. Sorry, bad point. Um, the, and again, the smaller the f-stop number, the wider the aperture, the larger amount of light comes. A camera body in one to two lenses can easily top $10,000. Uh, just as uh, just out of curiosity, I went on uh, Adorama to see what the digital equivalent of the Mamiya and Bronica cameras that I used to use, medium format, and those bodies can can run upwards of twenty five thousand dollars just for the camera body. So just like rocketry, you can end up spending an awful lot of money on your hobby. So for your uh, camera sensor sizes, uh, you'll have a full frame. It's uh, twenty four by thirty six millimeters. It's the size of a of the uh, former thirty five millimeter. Film negative, and that uh, most of the pro cameras will be will have that uh, full frame. Nikon calls it FX sensor. Uh, other cameras will have a crop or a CPSC sensor. Nikon calls it DX. Nikon's crop size it's about two thirds. Um, Canon's is a little less than that. Uh, some of the, I think uh, Lumix and Panasonic may be uh, down to a half size, but um, essentially the smaller the sensor. The, the less room you have for pixels. The trade-off though is if you carry the camera a lot, a lot of times the crop sensor cameras can be smaller. So, uh, medium format that I talked about earlier, you have a sensor that's three or four, three by four centimeters or sometimes even larger, but that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. And again, typically your, uh, your pro cameras are um, full frame, but not all of them. Other capabilities, so one thing I find very useful in, in my pro cameras and rocketry is the frame rate. I can get 12 or 14 frames a second um, out of the uh, pro digital SLR bodies that I have. And as I mentioned, the, the Z9, there's just some insane frame rates out there. Um, I think some of the higher end Sony's uh, are also running at about 20 frames a second. Most of these cameras, any new SLR, uh, digital SLR you buy today will have a video capability, uh, 4K. Uh, typically GPS location and tagging, and a lot of this is automatically loaded into the digital images you take, uh, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity to uh, connect to your computer or phone tablet. And it goes both ways. You can uh, transfer images via the system. You can also use an app on the phone or the tablet to control the camera from um, a relatively close distance via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Okay. Sorry, just checking my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Talked about some subject characteristics. The rockets are typically small. Uh, the majority of the hobby rockets we fly are not person-sized, um, but you do get some that are person-sized larger. 
and they're fast moving when they're launched. So you want um, in the, the the world of trade-offs, you want a fast shutter speed, less light comes in the camera with the fast shutter speed. So typically you're looking at the, the larger apertures, the smaller f-stop numbers. Uh, you will get some illumination variations. You get a light to dark finish on the rockets. Uh, this one has a fairly light gray finish if you get a you know, black or a dark green or a dark blue rocket. And uh, you get the bright exhaust flame. And that'll be one of the things I talk about later is adjusting your exposures for the for the uh, exhaust flame. And in this case, you can, uh, you have the the kind of the sagey, the green, lightish green, brown background. You have the gray of the mountains behind and then the lighter gray of the sky behind the rocket. This gray isn't too bad. It's got, um, but if you get a lot more bright sunshine, that can come, <coughs> excuse me, complicate the exposures. People, on the other hand, have a fairly tight size range. The variations between uh, adults and kids. They're typically not very fast moving and they have less extreme illumination variation. Uh, people and rockets together, uh, hopefully they're stationary when they're in close proximity. Uh, people at an appropriate safe distance in the forward background can enhance a liftoff photo. As I mentioned uh, or before, this is Matt Abbey's uh, AMRAM on a Sparky motor at uh, NSL here in 2021. Oh, and I'm sorry, I might have forgot to mention this photo, another large two, a large two-stage project at NSL. And this is one of, a, I'm pretty sure it's an Aerotech Blue Thunder propellant. You get that nice uh, initial jet and then the big blue bulb at the end of it. Okay. Okay. We'll talk about some techniques and settings, uh, the several things to cover the background behind the subject, the perspective of the subject itself, the aperture to use, the shutter speed to use, how to focus uh, on your subjects, <clears throat> lighting to use, um, and lighting of the subject and the light behind the subject. We'll talk about image format and then kind of a summary of the settings that I like to use. This is at NIRM 62. Uh, this was actually a photo rescue effort. Uh, Chris Hansen there in the picture had launched his L3 and it had drifted beyond the evil bean field, which claimed a lot of rockets at NIRM and into the cornfield. <clears throat> and he called me, I had my long lens on the camera and he called me on his cell phone and uh, asked me to guide him to which row or which or column in the cornfield to enter. So I was able to connect him on to the rocket to help him with this recovery. Okay, so some background settings, some background to talk about. So some of the things we're interested in the lighting, is it a dark tree line or a mountain range versus a bright, clear, cloudy sky? Or is the sun reflecting off a surface behind <clears throat> the subject? Distractions, cars, RVs, other people, uh, and porta potties. Uh, choose your background to minimize distractions if you can, uh, if the audience is distracted or raptured with the background, it, it, that detracts from the photo's effectiveness. And the use of a large <coughs> aperture, excuse me, or shallow depth of field to isolate focus on the subject if you have the cluttered background. Here you see some examples. Um, former NAR president, uh, Trip Barber, this was at uh, TARC 2019 and uh, walking in front of the porta potty. So it's a, it's a pretty good picture of Trip in profile, but the porta potties are not very they're not very out of focus and they're really a significant distraction that detracts from the image of trip himself <clears throat> excuse me the next two are um, rso check and table images from nsl i'm sorry from NARAM 62 and in the first photo the background is very cluttered you have the two gentlemen with their rockets but there's a tent there's multiple people behind them um, and again it, the background kind of takes your eye away from the main subject the third photo is a little better, a gentleman with his uh, beautiful upscale Estes interceptor. Uh, there's a little bit of distraction in the background. The people are farther away. The fourth, the fourth photo is really the best example of a clean background um, with the, uh, the shallow depth of field. So the subject is in focus. Uh, the background is fairly blurry, but it's really almost a monochrome background behind the gentleman. And another subcategory of, uh, of uh, rocket pictures is people 
take, taking pictures of people taking pictures. So talk a little bit about perspective, uh, your distance from you to the subject, your distance from the subject to the background, your relative height. Is it shot from above? Is it shot from even height? Or is it shot from below? Uh, long primes or telephoto lens, zoom lenses can bring off, can, can bring lift off shots closer at safe distances, but there are limits. And we'll talk about that a little more when I get into the, the remote camera system uh, a little bit later. Let's see. So in this case, you see the first one, I was basically standing straight up and about even. Chris was up on a trailer, so my the camera lens was about even with his belt there. And it's a nice photo, but it's uh, it, there's nothing. Uh, if you compare it to the second one, where I actually dropped down to my knees and shot from a little lower angle, uh, the rocket actually seems to, it's the appearances, it's leaning away from you, and there's almost a, uh, a feeling of motion to me it, it shows it's a little it, it, it's almost has a bit of a i'm getting ready to get out of here whether uh, as compared to the first one uh, and you know chris is essentially in the same position on that uh, on that shot here's another example of uh, perspective this is the high power fuselage uh, from the high power display at uh, tark 2019 <laughs> Um, we transition from the first photo with the, the sign is dominant in the picture with the three rockets in the background in a uh, landscape. Again, another landscape, but uh, in the second photo below it, but the rockets can, can, are catching your eye more with, uh, with the smoke trails in the background where the smoke trails in the first picture are essentially uh, hidden with the background. The third photo, even more dramatic, the three smoke trails and, uh, and a smaller emphasis on the sign. And the last one's really dramatic. You have the three rockets um, and not terribly well lit anymore. They're mostly shadows, but the uh, the flame trails are really dominant. The rockets have transitioned from the darker into the lighter part of the sky. And the, the sign itself has become uh, a much smaller part of the picture. Okay, and a little more perspective, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about the pad camera, but uh, the camera, this is a LEM mod, model that was flown at uh, NARAM 62 this summer from the flight line camera. I've got one perspective, and essentially the camera's up on a tripod, so the camera's at about the same height of, as the, uh, the model itself. Um, I, it is a fairly short, shallow depth of field, so you get the bokeh in the background. Uh, and as compared to the remote pad camera, uh, you can see it's just a little, the the tightness of the, sh the sharpness of the focus is just a little better. The um, the distance from the, the subject to the camera is is a little closer. I think on, I had the, uh, the aperture set a little uh, narrower, get a little more depth of field on this one, but it's a little lower and a little different perspective. And both of them are nice photographs, it's just the perspective is slightly different. The one thing I like uh, even more about the, the pad camera photo is that you can actually see the face of the LEM where you're so more or less looking at the back of it um, in, the, in the first photo. Let's see, anything more to talk about on perspective? No. Nope. Okay, um, lens aperture. Talked a little bit about that. On the left, uh, it's a large aperture, shallow depth of field. The background distance is large compared to the camera. This is uh, Ted Cochran's model. I call it the Maryland Sounding Rocket. It has an official name. I just don't remember what that is, but it's on display at the, I think at the BWI International Airport. And the second one is an Honest John launch at um, NSL uh, this summer, 2021. The aperture is the same, but the relative distance from the, the camera to the subject and the subject to the background is is larger so you don't get as much book there's still a little bit the background isn't clearly in focus but it's certainly less dramatic bokeh than the, the first picture um, and essentially it's the large aperture is a shallow depth of field and again light most light isolates the subject the small aperture with a deep depth of field keeps more of the entire image in focus uh, 
Um, and uh, again, I'll typically shoot large aperture for all liftoff shots, one to get more light and uh, the second reason to get that bokeh if I can. Here's a third example. This is a, um, a small aperture, deep depth of field. This was at Arliss um, in the Black Rock Desert in uh, early September. So you can see the, the background distance is large compared to the camera subject distance, yet most of the image is in recognizable focus. I think this was shot at F8, and you can go all the way up to F22 at least, and F32 with some lenses. Um, but the, the subjects themselves, the, uh, the rockets on the pads, and the uh, mountains in the background are all pretty much in focus. Charge speed. Uh, here we have a couple of examples of slow shutter speeds. These were taken at the 1985 Internats in uh, Yambol, Bulgaria. I really didn't have much to, I was probably at the max shutter speed the camera was operating at. The photo on the left, especially the model, small, fast moving and very blurry. Uh, the model on the right's larger, it's uh, heavier, it's not moving quite as fast, but it's uh, still slightly blurry. Uh, lots of light as you typically get at a rocket launch, but a much better, much better camera and faster shutter speeds. There we go. Okay, here we are, and this is these are from again Narum 62 this summer. Uh, the left a standard Estes interceptor motor Cato, and uh, the right was one of the Can Am. Uh, I think it was a payload altitude rocket uh, coming off the piston, and you can see how one eight thousandth of a second really stops the action for you. On the left, it's the 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 nose cone, the parachute, the shock cord, and all the little bits of it looks like dog barf wadding are caught uh, essentially stopped. And also the, the piston model on the right, uh, you can see little sparks and bits of uh, propellant plus the smoke trail coming out behind it. And typically I will shoot at 8,000th of a second uh, or as fast as the camera will go. Okay, uh, here was some focus uh, that we first XRS and Brothers Oregon. Didn't get the focus quite right. And I'll typically shoot in manual, so this was probably the result of me um, not getting the focus get dialed in quite right. But what can happen in autofocus if you don't use manual is that the focus point uh, on that's on the rocket, on the pad, as the rocket starts to move, can drift off to uh, somewhere else or the background. In comparison, this is pretty much a capture of Texas Mutex from a Washington Aerospace Club 60 acres launch near Seattle. And you can easily read, and, and that's a fairly good crop. You can easily read the decal on the side of the rocket and the thin lines and the nose cone are all very much in focus. Okay. We'll talk a little about, about lighting. Um, a bright sky, clear, cloudy behind the rocket complicates your proper exposure settings. Your exhaust flames can also be tricky. A properly exposed rocket can have a completely blown out, overexposed to the point of no recoverable detail exhaust plume, nothing but a bright spot. And reds, as we show here, are the worst for that. I'll typically slightly underexposed to give me better range on the flame and not have um, the background over bright. I can then adjust shadows or highlights in post-processing. So here we have um, a reasonably exposed, this was from um, LDRS this summer, a pretty good flame uh, or a rocket, but the flames washed out. We have a dark rocket with a, a better look at the flame. Uh, the third image, uh, I used what's called a, a, a linear filter in Lightroom to get the rocket properly exposed, but drag the linear filter up from the bottom of the, the image to darken the flame a little bit. Okay, for lighting for people, on the left, the subject's backlit, backlit. it's underexposed with, uh, you can see the shadows behind the subject. I'll use fill flash for people pictures at launches, and this is me getting ready to launch an Estes Star Lab on the uh, University of Maryland student parking lots in 1980, I'm sorry, 19, uh, 1980. On the right, it's a bright gray-white background with the sun off the subject's left. It's essentially similar lighting, uh, the light's coming from their left rather than my right, as in the first picture, but the fill flash exposes, gets me good exposure on the subjects. And it, the important thing for me is it gets rid of the shadows on faces 
uh, that are a lot harder to deal with in post. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, again, we discussed this a little bit, your two main sensor sizes, your full frame Nikon FX and your CPSC or crop sensor Nikon DX, about two thirds the size of a full frame. Uh, most SL, digital SLRs that you buy today will be one or the other. Uh, there are these four third cameras that the knowledge of, but essentially if you go out and buy a digital SLR package, it'll be either a crop front sensor or a full frame. Two image types, raw, it's an image. It's basically what the lens sees on the sensor and that's what you get on the, on the memory card. Uh, it typically requires post-processing into a JPEG or other format for display or printing. And the files can be pretty large. Uh, a raw file out of one of my pro cameras will be in the 27 to 30 megabyte range where the uh, corresponding JPEG image will be a half to a third of that. <clears throat> it's a, JPEG's a common photographic compression standard. Most of your cameras uh, your, or have the JPEG setting, I'd say the majority of photos are shot in that format. Uh, it allows for in-camera corrections, which can be very handy, reduces your time in post-processing, and it's also got smaller sizes for file transfer and editing. Uh, let's see, so a summary of the settings I'll use for rockets launches, I'll use a manual aperture, shutter speed, focus, and ISO. I'll have my aperture wide open, my shutter speed as fast as possible, and ISO, I'll adjust it to get slightly underexposed to try to get some detail in the flame and autofocus, I'll use autofocus to get close and then switch to manual before liftoff. For people, I'll typically use auto or program, whichever your camera calls the, the automatic functions and I'll use fill flash and bright outside settings. And again, to improve the subject illumination and reduce the face shadows. And many, ca many cameras have the ability to preset some user settings. So if I'm shooting a rocket launch and I'm F2.8 and one eight thousandth of a second and maybe ISO 3000, I can set that in a preset and then switch my uh, function dial back and forth between auto program and those manual settings uh, for uh, when I'm editing. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the types of shots uh, for rockets. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, I left that. Didn't catch all my mistakes. For rockets, the type of shots you'll see, I get four main ones for me, lift off shots, smoke trails, recovery, and carnage. For people and rockets, you get the prep area and the RSO check-in tables, your pad prep, post-flight, uh, recovery, and cert flight, congratulations. Your launch crew, your LCO, and pad managers, managers and then group photos. This is a, uh, a sport flight. At NARAM 62 this summer, I have several of these. It was kind of cool. The flag was, the wind was such, and the flag was in the correct position to get these shots with the flag in the background. Okay, uh, for your people interactions, uh, people can be a tricky subject. Uh, you have posed, you have surprised and spontaneous. Some people don't want their photos on social media. I had several requests about that. Funny and amusing to you may not seem, um, may seem embarrassing to your subject. You wanna take extra care uh, with students and uh, children and minors. There may be parental concerns and there also, uh, there were several instances at NARAM where kids were out on the range where they shouldn't be and obviously we don't wanna publicize that kind of thing. Photography. So uh, be polite, courteous, and be amenable to your subject's concerns. Oh, here's some uh, rocket uh, liftoff shots. Uh, in the first one, you have the launch tower with mostly the sky in the background in the middle. That's a big Bertha from uh, NARAM 62. Uh, the good bokeh, the good blurriness in the background, uh, and partial sky, partial ground. And then the third one is another NXRS photo from the summer of 2018. Uh, a little more definition to the background and the rocket uh, highlighted against the bright sky. Smoke trail shots. Uh, the first one is, this is after the 1985 uh, internats on our way back to uh, Germany. We'd stopped somewhere in Yugoslavia and picked, had picked up some models and some motors and just decided to have an M2 
impromptu launch session outside the back of the hotel. Uh, the second one is from NXRS. I'm sorry, it's from one of the big Nevada launches, uh, just a, an amazing smoke trail of a high altitude flight. Oh, okay, lost the video, huh? Okay, let me try this. Let me get back to this. Stand by one. Um, screen sharing. Okay, I'm watching the chat. Is uh, is that back? So there's about a 10 second delay, I think. I just, somehow the screen sharing got disconnected. So, so I'm seeing more comments and it is showing me that I'm sharing my screen. Uh, okay, I see good now, all right. Okay, I'll go back to the previous slide. Uh, so, talk about the people shots, the lift off shots, the three variations. Uh, smoke trail shots, the um, middle one is a, uh, one of the big uh, black rocket launches. The right one is a Sparky motor trail from LDRS 39. Uh, recovery, uh, we have uh, rockets under parachute. I really used not to pay much attention to these, but um, people seem, I've had a couple of inputs that people want these photos. So those can be kind of neat. And then also the, these are a couple of Frank Burke's RCRGs uh, gliding back. Okay, so let me see. I'm seeing comments about how I missed slides. Um, okay, I'm back to the honest John uh, and setting summary, is that far enough? Okay, well, I'll just cycle through the pictures. I think you've heard the audio and then the presentation will be available to you uh, later to review. And I apologize for the issue. Uh, the fourth category that, um, again, the, the fast shutter speeds really help is what I call carnage. Uh, Kato's shreds and lawn darts. I've got a couple of really good lawn dart pictures. I just couldn't find them at the moment or in time for, to make the presentation. Uh, the first one is uh, Steve, um, that's a Can-Am uh, rocket from NARAM-62, it's one of the small A-motor Cato. Uh, the second one's some kind of, um, you know, 38 or 54 millimeter reload in a V2 at Arliss, and the third one is uh, an experimental rocket motor Cato. Um, and it, as you can see, it just, it, the casing over pressurized and it let go right at liftoff. Moving on to people shots, uh, you have uh, the prep area uh, on the left is from Arliss. On the right is another throwback that's Matt Steele and Mike Michi and Gamble in 1985, uh, prepping uh, Mike for a, a round of uh, the SAE, the RC rocket glider. Uh, RSO check-in tables, uh, NARAM 62 and NSL. Uh, pad prep, uh, TARC 2019, uh, gentlemen Rob Lamb and Mike Fisher at an OROC launch. This is the uh, the faraway cell we called it up on the hill. And then NARAM 62, it's always fun to see people assisting kids, either the, their, their own kids or helping families get rockets on the pad. Uh, launch crew, the, this is the NARAM 62 LCO table and your former NAR president, uh, Ted Cochran in uh, running the range at TARC 2019. And this is a mixture of, uh, uh, this is a, oh, I'll talk about post and spontaneous on the next slide. Recovery, uh, OREX and um, Sparks owned Bob Janacek uh, on recovery in the Oregon Sage. And then uh, Dan Michael uh, congratulating uh, Chris Hansen on his successful L3 cert at NARAM 62 this summer. And then group photos, uh, the first one's from uh, the last live Narcon in 2020 in, in Tucson, the, some kind of a presentation involving uh, 3D glasses. And then the second one is a NARAM uh, 62 group photo from the summer. And then pose versus spontaneous. So on the left is Bernard Colley from uh, Washington Aerospace Club, the Boeing uh, Model Rocket Club with one of Frank Burke's 
RCRGs that cling on B7. Battle cruiser on the right, uh, Mark Wise, John Hockheimer, and I think that's Glenn Fevrier, but I'm not sure at the uh, NRM62 LCA. Okay, talk a little bit about processing digital images, uh, commercial editing programs. I mostly use Adobe Lightroom. I dabble in, in Photoshop, but I just haven't gotten uh, terribly familiar with that yet. Again, the raw images usually have to be post-processed into another format. Your JPEG images can be printed, uploaded straight out of the camera. Your cell phones, your tablets, you can process images with the native apps, and there's plenty of aftermarket apps, including very versions of uh, Lightroom and Photoshop for the uh, handheld devices, and Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connectivity for acquiring the camera images and also doing some remote camera controlling at short distances. So my typical workflow at a rocket launch is on the field, I'll do one or two uploads from the camera uh, and light post-processing typically on my iPad. And I'll push those out to social media. I'll also do panoramic flight line shots with the cell phone. Uh, and when I work with the computer, I'll use a physical link, uh, car to direct to the camera for my file transfer. Uh, I'll do a quick scan with the laptop photo viewer to discard the obvious stuff that's, you know, the, the rocket's out of the picture, the person's not looking at you, the, it's grossly out of focus. And then I'll import what's left, the called images, into my uh, editing program for additional processing. This is uh, Moonrise oh, at uh, Brothers Oregon at one of the launches, I think it was NXRS 28. And finally, we'll talk about the remote camera system. I came to the point where I was needing to have uh, camera coverage close up and a, a trigger system with a thousand plus range. Uh, you need the extended safety distances for large or complex rockets, uh, significant croppings required, uh, uh, and should be even, not event, with long telephoto lenses. And you have atmospheric effects at long ranges, especially on hot days with uh, either dust or heat waves that distort your ground images. Uh, commercially available remote camera triggers can have limited range, you know, 50 to 100 feet in some cases. And then uh, the requirements that a plug-in camera push button trigger can be activated by closing uh, a, re a relay. And then the remote wireless connectivity problem to solve. Uh, the camera located close to the launch pad provides vastly improved images while maintaining as an example, this is a shot from LDRS this summer. It's uh, Bryce Chains flying one of the Gates Brothers rockets, the Sumo. Uh, the original image on the left and the crop to the right. As you can see, it's still, you know, with a JPEG with a Pro Series camera, you can significantly crop the images, but it does lose something. For the remote camera system, uh, my first attempt was a radio system or relay triggered with an audio input. I found a, an audio board that I could loop. I could connect on the camera side um, and transmit on a ham handheld or a FRS handheld. The um, it would pick up the audit, the frequency or pick up the signal. Um, the board would close the relay and fire the camera. Uh, pretty variable reliability. It was subject to static, where the camera could would fire when there was static on that particular channel and other uses on the selected frequency. And I could never get it to work reliably. Reliably. Uh, the second attempt was, um, you can find an awful lot of uh, like pump control, or garage door control systems on Amazon and other places that claim to have two or 3,000 foot range and typically they're significantly less, some of up to a tenth. So uh, I ended up getting connected with a, a colleague of Vern Knowles and we were collaboratively working on a system that's got audio controlled relays. Uh, the, the comms are handled by stacked LoRa shield boards in the 432 megahertz range. And the tested range is to one mile with a directional antenna. And so far it's been highly reliable and I'll be using that system more and more in the coming flying season. So there's an example here again from LDRS 40, that exact same Sumo launch, but with the remote camera trigger and you can see there's uh, significantly less crop in the image. And the you know crop, this one landscape versus uh, portrait. Uh, in this case, I wanted to get the smoke, or the full smoke plume. So that's why it's in the landscape. And a couple more remote camera images, again, from LDRS and uh, two third scale iris on an AirTech N20. The sparkies are always great for the remote images. And then some more from Balls, that's Alex Pavlik's huge uh, 
R R S hybrid, I forget which. I like this one a lot because it got that big burst of flame and illuminated the flag hanging there. Uh, Buddy Michelson's O3400 flight, and then I forget the gent's name, but it was another two stage project in the falls. Okay, uh, coming to the end here, um, you always need to acknowledge folks that have gone before you and help you out. Um, some folks I'd like to recognize, I, I uh, mentioned old Ed Pearson. He, uh, he really, Ed, Ed's the reason I'm, I stayed in the hobby. He came to my house and picked me up as a young teenager and took me to Narham's launches. And, uh, I'm sorry, Narham's meetings and uh, my first regional meet. And again, I'd like to say all kinds of things, but today it'll just be thanks for everything. Uh, Herb Dezen, some of you may remember Herb. He was known as Mr. Cinerock. I lived about five minutes from him, and he, his presence and guidance really planted the rocket photography in my mind. My high power cert officials, uh, Dennis Winningstad and Pat Gordzlik, uh, John Lingdahl and Trip Barber, their leadership for NAR, significant NAR programs that have brought young people back into the hobby. And basically, they urge other people to be volunteers by setting a great example. And uh, Solo Dan, uh, first met him at Fire in the Sky 2003, and introduced, really took some amazing high power photography images that really got me back into the hobby photography with rocketry. And then my regular rocket photo collaborators, Rick Clapp, Gary Goncher, Chuck Haskin, Kent Newman, and Peter Thune. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for attending. Um, I'll uh, open up the questions here. Uh, here's a, a QR code and the URL if you want to see more of my rocket photos. And as mentioned there, I'm, it'll ask you for your name and email on the welcome screen. And I just keep track of who's accessing the galleries. So with that said, I will look at the q and I'll scan the chat first. And... Go to the Q&A here. Uh, David Kane, do you overshoot or shoot the bare minimum? And I, I probably uh, calling, you know, especially with launch shots, really getting close to lift off and stopping shooting after the rocket leaves the frame like you. Yeah, the calling can take a long time. Uh, photo releases. <laughs> Um, you mean as far as uh, David, um, do you mean um, releases for people? I think people in general, when they come to these launches, get photos. And I don't sell people photos for commercial purposes. I'll sell copies to them if they want photos themselves. But um, if I were to use them for any kind of a commercial advertising purpose, I would need to get a photo release from the subjects. Uh, Phil Flash, I have a couple. I have the Nikon. Uh, I think it's uh, the SBs. I've got a 5000 and a 910. Yeah, Mets. We used to have the big Mets flash wars when I was working on yearbook staff in college. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed some of them. Oh, they're coming from the top, not the bottom. That's why I'm missing them. Okay. Uh, Ron's Rockets. What video can be suggest under 1000 for capturing low power launches? Cell phones are difficult to handle and DSLR too slow focus. Thanks. Uh, as far as specific video, I think the GoPros do really well for rocket launches. I've got one. I haven't used it a lot, but I know people use them. The downside for the GoPros, you basically have to set it there and turn it on and walk away. But with a low power launch, you can probably end up uh, using the remote uh, to turn it off and on. I use that some at uh, Narab 62. Uh, spread spectrum RC system. Yeah, Andrew, I... I um, you know, it's the radio uh, frequency stuff. I, you know, I'm a ham basic, but um, I found this, uh, the lower shield board with collaboration with uh, a colleague of Vern Knowles, and that seems to be working pretty well for me. Burst mode for photos, how fast? Um, I, I know, Tom, I know burst mode exists. I'm just not real familiar with it. I'll use the the, the high-speed shutter settings, uh, either 10, 12, or 14 frames a second on my, uh, on my uh, Pro SLRs. Uh, and usually I'll get, depending on how close I am and uh, how fast the rocket's moving, I'll get anywhere from four to 10 or 12 liftoff shots. That one shot of uh, Alex Pavlik's rocket uh, it was moving fairly slowly, even though I was close, the one on the left there. 
even though it was moving fairly slowly, I probably got 10 or 15 really good images before it went out of frame. Oh, let's see, Gary, can you talk about how you store and manage all the imagery afterward? Uh, yeah, I, Gary, I've mostly been storing it on a laptop and external hard drives. And what I'll do is I'll create a folder for an event and I'll import that folder into Lightroom. And that way my Lightroom headings and my folders on my computer are named, I'll break it out by year. I am at the at the moment, I've got, I've bought the parts for a Synology uh, external land storage system in my house that I'll be setting up here. Shooting on a bright day with the snow background, my photos tend to wash out. That's where I'd really recommend using uh, the fill flash and you know, um, the auto, I use the auto function with the fill flash. And uh, I would give that a try and then possibly end up going manual and um, you know, picking the, the camera shutter speed at a 60th or 200th, and then really work on your aperture and your ISO uh, with the with the flash at that point, um, probably a lot of trial and error. But I was seeing a fair bit of that uh, Severia at the uh, Severio at the LDRS launch with that bright salt background. But the fill flash is your first the first thing you should try. Shopping for a DSLR, what is the min frame per second? In my experience, the min's seven. Um, yeah, I I wouldn't go any slower than seven um, if you're really serious about capturing high high speed. Um, HPR launches, I'd, I'd shoot for at, at 10 and above. And really, as long as you've got that um, eight thousandth of a second shutter speed or four thousandth at a minimum, you'll catch launches. Uh, you'll just get fewer of them. And what I'll do, um, one thing I really didn't talk about too much is um, is the trigger uh, trigger technique. I'll usually wait. I'll, I'll let the countdown run till about two or one. Um, and I will either use the trigger button. I've really gotten used to using a remote, uh, a corded remote camera trigger so I can set the camera on a tripod. Have my hands on the camera itself. Okay. We've got about three minutes left. I think that's it. I will cruise the chat here briefly to see if there are any questions there. Yeah, David uh, Kane, you meant you mentioned about uh, replacing cameras, and that's one of the reasons why. I'd, I'd, and I'd shoot high school photos too. Uh, I'm not looking to make a living off of it, but I, you know, I charge a regional amount for the photos, and that allows me to build up an account to, from both maintenance and to uh, and to replace equipment as it goes along. And uh, Curtis, uh, yeah, absolutely right. You lots of good used gear out there, especially as the newer stuffs come out. Um, you know, be careful on eBay. Be especially careful on Craigslist, but um, your reputable repair uh, or refurb shops like Roberts or KEH, there's some good deals to be had there. Uh, 1.2 millimeter lenses. Uh, Donald, you're probably right. Um, Nikon's talking about a 0.95 f-stop lens for its mirrorless cameras. Yeah, Tom Broad again. I'd, I'd uh, for the rockets, really the GoPro is, is a great a great thing to have. You can set it there at the base of the of the uh, the launch area and just uh, and let it go and again with low power you can control it with a uh, with the remote because it's fairly close range uh david kane the topaz sharp yeah i've had david i've had a lot of people recommend that topaz to me i just haven't take uh, i guess it works real well as a plug-in with lightroom i just haven't jumped into it yet uh okay we solved the video problem Yes. All right. Well, that looks pretty much looks like the Q&A list is done. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, Tom Schwann going to give me a list of who attended. If uh, just as a thanks for attending, if you want to look at the photo galleries, if there's one out there, um, uh, some photos you'd like, I'd like to offer the folks that were kind enough to attend a 15% discount on photo purchases from my Tahoma photography site. And you can just uh, send uh, send me an email, and 
you can contact me directly through that to home, through the Zenfolio site, and, and then I'll have a list of the folks that attended and apply that discount for you. All right, well, we've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, any final questions? Okay, well, once again, everybody, thanks for attending. I'm gonna stop the broadcast here shortly and uh, please enjoy the rest of NARCON.